Good evening and welcome to this special meeting of Lompoc City Council. Um, tonight we are forming this as a town hall meeting on homelessness. Um, Madam Clerk, we have roll call, please. Council Member Vega? Here. Council Member Starbuck? Present. Council Member Osborne? Here. Mayor Pro Tem James Mosby? Present. Mayor Bob Lingle? Here. If you'll please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing just for a moment. I want to just have us uh, have a moment of silence for the victims and families of the Manchester disaster that took place yesterday. Okay, thank you. Please be seated. Okay, before we get going this evening, I just want to sort of tell you the genesis and a little bit about this meeting. So, as many of you know, I've been having um, coffees every month for the last several years, and at least two of my coffees recently have been focused on homelessness. And both of those uh, meetings generated a lot of interest, a lot of conversation, a lot of input, both pro and con. And basically, I mean, pretty much filled up the first or the front half of Southside Coffee. So uh, Mr. Jeff Schaefer was at, from C3H, was at one of, I guess we were at both meetings. And he um, agreed to form a little committee to put together all of the players that work on homelessness here in this community. So Jeff, if you just sort of introduce the people that are here tonight that are gonna be doing their presentations. Maybe you wanna come up, Jeff, come up to the podium so everyone can hear. Uh, thank you, Mary Lingle, um, members of the city council and members of the public for coming tonight. Uh, there are several different presenters uh, from Housing and Sh Shelter and Treatment Partners that are here tonight to, to talk to you about what's going on to address homelessness locally. Uh, Police Chief um, Pat Walsh is here. He'll be sharing with us. Uh, Mark Ashmala from Transition to Mental Health. If you want to raise your hand so everyone can see. Uh, Shondell Malcolm from Planning a Seed. They do a bunch of outreach in the community. Uh, Pastor Brian Halterman from Trinity Church is here. We also have Sylvia Bernard from Good Samaritan Shelter. Michael Allen from Behavioral Wellness is here. Chuck Manson from Coast Valley Treatment Center. And uh, Sanford Riggs is here as well if you wanna talk about housing um, in the, what's happening around housing in Lompoc. And my role is really, I'm the coordinator, I'm with the Central Coast Collaborative on Homelessness helping to coordinate all the partners in Lompoc. So thanks for having us tonight. Thank you, Jeff. So. Our goal tonight is not necessarily to solve the issues because it's a very compound issue of homelessness and it's not just here in Lompoc, as you know. Um, we have homelessness, the issue of homelessness is literally worldwide. Um, but tonight I wanna to focus on what we can do here in the city of Lompoc, the Lompoc Valley, and possibly even spread out a little bit part of the uh, Santa Barbara County, Northern Santa Barbara County, to address the issues. Now, um, like I say, we're not going to solve the problem, but if you have some suggestions on how we can help the problem, help the issues, uh, please take your opportunity. We're going to start off with a, it'll be a three minute oral communication. During that oral communication, state your, your feelings one way or the other, but also if you have a question, sort of pose the question and we'll try to address those questions during our conversations. So let's start with um, oral communication. Step up to the podium and uh, take up to three minutes. State your opinion on homelessness here in, in Lompoc. And if there's a question you'd like addressed tonight, you can state that as well. So does anyone want to step forward right now? Okay, we'll have public comment after each. Yeah, if you do, yes. Uh, step, step forward to the podium. Yeah. 
Yeah, they will. Hi, um, my name is Rich Zellers, and uh, I live uh, across from the bridge house. So I live in the big yellow house there. And so um, to give you an example of my concerns, three minutes, right? Uh, so about a half hour ago, a meeting dinner, uh, we found out about the meeting, and I look out my window. I have two little kids, too. And there's a man walking through my yard, uh, coming out of the river, and he's just wandering through by my boat, uh, going through my stuff. Uh, and that's one of my main concerns, plus if my kids, my kids are home alone right now, so I have to have my phone on, et cetera. Um, I also have a concern about the, the fire concern in the river with all the brush, if that could be answered. Um, because there's, there have quite a few uh, fireplaces built in the riverbed now, so there's quite a bit of, uh, they have actual houses and stoves, that, the people down there. So if you ever talk to the people down there, there's a lot of them that, um, they're kind of living off the grid, you know, they want to live down there. So I think there's a little bit of concern that, uh, I'm not saying they want to be homeless, but it's a little bit of a style of living with some of the younger people. So they want to be in the river because that's their style of living and that's what they want. But they're actually building homes with, st I'm a little concerned of the fire damage there. Uh, another concern I have is the bridge house. I've tried, I've exhausted every possible means of phone calls walking over there. I just want them to put a sign up that says bridge house. Uh, daily I get people driving in, running over my stuff, getting stuck in my sand, running over my farm equipment. Um, there was a guy sitting on my tractor the other day smoking a cigarette. We get people smoking in our barn. Um, I just need them to put a sign up that says bridge house so people know it's not my house. Uh, I know people say, well, you put up a sign that says not bridge house, but I think it's fair enough to say that they should um, put a sign up. Because if you look, it says no trespassing on their driveway, and so people come into my driveway and uh, it's, it's getting worse over the last couple months here. I, and when my kids are home, it's a little difficult for them to go out. Uh, my son, he's 13, and he has to go out. He was out this, today uh, when he got home from school. He had to go out and tell a man to leave. Uh, that's just another concern. Uh, another concern is, uh, are they going to let the, the river system build, or are they going to put a cap on the number of houses being built in there? Or what's the, what's the ruling going to be? How much is going to be built in the river? Or are they going to, you know what I mean? Is there going to be a limit to how many people can actually live in the river at some point? Are they going to put a cap on it? Uh, I fenced my property off, but they just keep coming through the fence. Um, half my stuff's been stolen to build their houses. So I have concern for the homeless. Okay, I, I've, you know, I, I'm, that's not my point. My point is to tell you that there's... I think it's a difficult life. I'm not heartless. It's not my point. But if you live next to there, you know the, the difficulty it is. So sure. that's okay. my three minutes. Thank you. So. No, thank you. And we'll, we'll try to get that addressed this evening. Um, Bob Nelson, if, if you want to come over the table over there, because I, I want you to have the availability of a microphone, is, is Supervisor Hartman here? She was, she was going to be here. Okay, if she comes, we'll ask her to sit over there as well, because I know... I know this is an issue that uh, Supervisor Adams' office wanted to bring up this evening is the, the river bottom, so uh, we'll get that, try to get that addressed this evening. Anyone else? Okay. Um, no one else? We're going to close our old communication. And what we're going to do, the way this meeting is going to go, we're going to have presenters from the different agencies that we introduced. If time permits, we will... The council will have discussion with the presenters. Um, if there's time, we'll allow some input from the public, but we want to try to keep this to about two hours. So if you have a question about a presentation, be real specific about your question. We'll try to get it addressed, okay? So uh, let's start with the first presenter, um, the point in time study. This is, uh, yes, okay, got it. And some people may not be aware some people may not be aware of what the point in time study is, so you may want to just yeah, address give it. a little background. Sure. Um, members of City Council, members of the public, I'm Chuck Flax. I'm with the Central Coast Collaborative on Homelessness, 
and we were uh, hired by the county to oversee the point in time count. Some of you actually participated in it. And what is it? It's a, it's a federally mandated required count of both sheltered and unsheltered homeless people on the street. It's done over the course of one week all across the country. You pick a particular night and then you go out and you count as many people as you possibly can. And um, we were, I mean, that's really kind of the bottom line of, of my presentation. We were very successful in Lompoc at counting homeless people, more successful maybe than any other count that's been done in the last uh, eight years. Um, really what so the results were that uh, in, when the count was completed in end of January, there were 219 people counted. Compared to 2015, that's an 89% increase. Um, 67 people uh, were unsheltered and the remainder, which is, you know, what is that, 150 or so, were sheltered. Oh, great. Oh, yeah, I'll do that. That's great. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so I'll, let me take a step back. So go, go back to the previous slide. Thank you. Um, so what we did here in Lompoc, and we actually did this in every other uh, community in, in Santa Barbara, is we set up a care and referral center to attract homeless people to come and get services. And the benefit of this, for, for one thing, it was one of the coldest nights of the year. Um, so it was good to get people inside and, and many, many people uh, took advantage of this and ended up um, staying the night at the uh, winter shelter. Um, but in addition, people who had never been counted before and who had never admitted to being homeless or made themselves available in any way came out. And um, because they, there were a lot of people that had gotten to know them over the course of the last couple of years that C3H and our partner agencies have been working with this community. Um, the Freedom Warming Centers were critical. They are a, another county funded and also city funded uh, resource that happens during inclement weather during the, the cold months. And they participated in the count and helped us count people and, and, and house people for the night. Um, and then I mentioned a little bit about street outreach. So one of the things that C3H is doing here in Lompoc is collaborating with a whole host of service providers, law enforcement, city staff, county staff, to really get to know each homeless person by name, if possible, and really try to focus on their needs and develop services that are tailored to each individual. Um, so let's go to the results, great. So 219 people, as I said, compared to 2015, it was an 89% increase. Um, the majority were sheltered for the night, at least, um, and it was, you know, really the bottom line headline is that this was the largest count increase in the county. Uh, there's been some debate in the media about what that's all about, and I'm sure that some people here believe that, that there's been this migration of homeless people to Lompoc, but our, our own research, our own understanding of the community, our conversations with the homeless population are in fact what I was saying before, which is that this is really the first time people were, felt safe to be counted felt trusted and could come forward and talk to, to their neighbors and to the community. And we have to thank Trinity Church and Good Samaritan and uh, you know, the, the variety of other providers um, that supported this to make this happen. Um, and I'm happy, I'm gonna stay throughout the, the Oh, <laughs> I'm going to stay throughout the, the presentation. If people have more questions either about C3H or about, um, you know, my perspectives, I'm happy to do it. I have Jeff Shaver, who's our uh, regional director and knows Lompoc much better than I do, um, directing many of the, the presentations that you'll see. But this is really sort of the snapshot for Lompoc. And let me just say one final clo closing piece. Um, the uh, Santa Barbara as a whole has had a consistent number of homeless people over the last eight years. It's about 1,500 people. And I can't explain to you why it's been that way. You know, in other parts of the state, in, in many uh, other cities around the, the country, there's been a significant increase in homelessness. In Santa Barbara, it stayed re relatively consistent. And I have some personal theories about it, but I don't have any hard data to tell you why it stayed so consistent. And that's part of why we think Lumpo didn't see a huge increase. It's more about getting to know people. And from our perspective, getting to know people is the first step in getting people housed and getting them off the streets. So thank you very much. Okay, um, you may want to stick around in case the council or someone. Okay, so um, Supervisor Hartman came now. So the reason I'm having the two of you sit by the microphones is if you, we'd love to have you participate in the discussion as well, since this is not just a city problem, it's a county problem, so. Um, so any discussion on C3H? Anyone? 
point of time, point of time study? Okay. Okay. We'll move on to um, four steps. Okay. Um, so I've introduced myself earlier, but some of you may have come in. Uh, my name is Jeff Schaefer. I'm the director of regional coordination for the Central Coast Collaborative on Homelessness. And what I want to share with um, both city council and the public is something that I truly believe in that I learned under Becky Canis, who organized a 100,000 homes campaign um, and throughout the United State, States helped house over 100,000 um, people um, over about a four to five year period. And for her, so there's four steps. If we want to talk about, if we want to talk about the steps of solving homelessness, I don't see that these steps can be um, skipped. And whether you're talking about individuals or families, um, the first step is that in, so if you think about Lompoc, the first step to solving homelessness is everyone who's experiencing homelessness has to be known by name. Um, their story has to be known. It has to be known by some provider. It has to be known by uh, somebody who currently is in a potentially housed situation. Um, it starts the uh, trust relationship, um, and then that trust leads to whatever next steps um, happen. Um, C3H and the partners here that are going to speak here today are not about um, forcing housing upon and, and anyone, but my own personal belief is that most people experiencing homelessness don't want to be outdoors. They don't want to be there. There are some that do, and, it, and we're not going to impose anything on them, but a lot of people just need that trust and hope rebuilt, and then they need to see steps for themselves to get out of the situation they're in. Then we talk about knowing what they want and what they need, and it's crucial that we as people who are trying to help them and who are housed, we obviously have opinions about what they need when we step into their zone, whether it be their encampment, whether it be in front of the establishment where they are, we might have opinions, um, but our opinions oftentimes are erroneous or not the first thing that needs to happen. So the first thing that needs to happen when we're talking about people experiencing homelessness is finding out what they want rather than what we want. So over time, however, the time, I'm, I've worked with people a long time on the street, so that can, be a, that can be a two to three encounter time where it opens up, or that can be six months before they start really opening up and sharing who they really are and what they really want and what they need. We also need to line up the things that we know that people need. So we know the people on the streets. If you look at the data, we know that 60% of the people on the streets are suffering some sort of mental um, health issue. Um, we know that um, uh, one out of two has some level of addiction. So we know we have to line up um, resources. We know we have a lack of uh, uh, affordable housing potentially, so we have to line up those things. But So we know kind of what they need as well when they're ready for it. The third point is lining up and expanding resources. So once you begin to get data, so right now it's the first time in Lompoc as far as outreach. So all the folks doing outreach, it's the first time that we can share data. We have something called vertical change in which partners that are in Lompoc can all get online. That data is taken. A lot of the data that people do a vulnerability index. You can get online and multiple partners can share the caseload to try to assist people. So for the first time, we can begin to see, okay, what are the, what are the cross, what are the core occurring needs that people are expressing? What are the gaps in our system? And we can begin to figure that out. So you have to, once you learn all this information, which takes some time, you have to begin to line up resources and also expand resources, meaning Lompoc doesn't have probably everything it needs to address the problem. A lot of, the, a lot of what's here is um, helping, but we need to figure out how to bring in more resources. So if you think about C3H over time, and the partners in Lompoc. Um, we got Doctors Without Walls to come this last year to begin to do free medical care. Um, AmeriCorps has come, which has brought uh, forth several members of AmeriCorps that's funded by the federal government. So Lompoc didn't pay for anything. So you begin to expand resources that helps outreach. And AmeriCorps has helped many, several people into housing um, this year. Um, and the last point is provide permanent housing and supportive services. Um, I've also seen over time, so we have, to, we have to do housing searches, we have to find out who takes Section 8, who doesn't take Section 8, um, what, what apartment buildings at what level, low income, um, what does it mean when you say low income, because every apartment complex is a little bit different. So you have to begin to line up the housing opportunities, but also what I've seen is you, in order to keep people out of going back to homelessness, you have to set up long-term retention. You have to have the idea that the team that is with 
this individual is going to stay with this individual up to 18 months because statistics show that after 18 months if you've been housed, you're more likely to stay housed. So for our team, a coordinated outreach team, that's our commitment. Once we help get people housed, we'll stay with them up to 16 months and try to continue to help them remain housed so they're not coming back out, going in and out over and over again, experiencing homelessness. So those are just my four steps. I personally don't believe, when I came, one of the things when I came to Lompoc is I, is I realized that there are a bunch of street outreach folks that are out there that do know a lot of people by name, but we didn't know everyone. We still don't know everyone. But this is the first time in the past year that we're really beginning to share data and work together in a more coordinated way. So I feel like we're somewhere in between the level of two and three on the steps. Um, and so that's my four steps. That's all I got. Thank you. Okay. Any questions for me? Steve, yeah. You know, questions for Jeff? Jeff, I have a couple questions. First of all, I, I just want to point out that I've, ever since I got to know you and learned a little bit about C3H, the thing I'm most impressed with is that C3H, from what, what I can see and what I understand, is to provide permanent housing for people. You're, you're not there just to give them food for the day. Um, give them some loose change, get them through the day, but your, look, your goal is to get them in permanent housing. Am I correct on that? So the, the old, I guess you would say that we have two, C3H kind of exists for two reasons, and one of them is because we know that homelessness has impacts on the community, so as to assist where impacts are happening on the community, as well as to bring about solutions, and the ultimate solution is housing, so I would agree with that. I think we also exist to coordinate all the partners. If we're not doing all the housing, there's many partners here that are helping assist people into housing. We're just coordinating it, but, but so I, I would agree. Okay, so I'm gonna sort of ask the question that may be out there, it's been pointed, brought to me, my attention quite often. It's sort of like the white elephant question. Is be, Lompoc is a very giving community, and we have, as we can tell, a lot of agencies that are here to help the homeless, the less fortunate than us. Um, so the question has been posed to me several times. If we make it so nice, like if we build it, they will come. So, well, it's, it's been posed that way. If we build it, they will come. And uh, now you explained that we have an 89% increase, but it may, may not actually be an 89% increase. It may just be a phenomenon. So. Now you're working with all the different agencies. This is one of the goals of this meeting, get all the agencies to work together. So would you say that the goal in general is to get people out of homelessness and not just provide for a day, two days? Yes. Oh yeah, I think everyone, you can ask individual providers, but I would imagine that's, for all of us, that's true. Sure, and okay. I, I would say what, what, what data also shows is that 60, percent of those who are experiencing homelessness in Lompoc have a connection to Lompoc. So it's not like they're going to move on. This is kind of their city. Um, so, it, so if you think about strategies to help, there's also reunification that can be put into play for people that have somewhere that's better for them, not just moving them on, but if we can find a better opportunity for them, then you can move that into play as well. But it, we're all solution-based. Um, no one here wants to see homelessness continue. Um, the only, yeah. Okay. Councilman Mosby. What, what percentage do you say have a connection to Lombok? Six out of, I would say six out of 10. Okay. And then another 20% another, uh, across the board pretty much have connection to California or the county as a whole. And, <clears throat> and what percent, I, it's been, I've heard different figures. What percent of those are veterans? 10 to 12 percent. 10 to 12 percent veterans, and that is of the 60 percent, or is it 10, the veterans are from dispersed throughout? Um, well, you, there are some folks that do outreach specifically to veterans that come up will be coming up later. Can probably answer okay, good, the question okay. as far as veterans who are currently on the streets, if they're local or if they're from somewhere outside of Lompoc. Okay, sounds good. Anyone else? Yes. Bob, Bob Nelson from the uh, county, 4th District. How many of them are families? Uh, when Sylvia comes up during the Good Samaritan, I don't know if you want to state now or you want to wait till the... Yeah. Sylvia, come on up to the microphone. Sylvia. 
So I don't know if you can go back to the slide that showed the sheltered that were on the point in time count, but out of those sheltered, probably 70% are families mm. within our sheltered system. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Okay, uh, move on to outreach, uh, Lompoc Police Department. Chief Walsh. Thank you, Mayor, for giving me an opportunity to speak. Um, I think it's really important that the community knows our, our stance on the homelessness because I get a lot of calls on what I'm going to do about the homelessness. And so it just, I've said it before, and you know, homelessness is not a, a crime. It's not a crime to be homeless, uh, and nor is it a police matter. And quite frankly, we'd like to be out of the business altogether. Um, that said, we can address the bad behavior, drinking in public, drunk in public, urinating where they shouldn't, camping where they shouldn't, uh, aggressive panhandling, and, and, and uh, the law is very specific. It has to be aggressive, not just panhandling. Um, you know, in theft, where, you know, uh, there's a lot of opportunity in town to, uh, to supplement your lack of income by stealing, and there is some stealing going on. Not, not all homeless people steal, but uh, there's a 600-pound pizza oven in uh, the river right now being used that we found and was stolen from a restaurant. So uh, we can address that. That's what we're here for. Uh, and, and when they're in somebody's yard and rummaging through their boat, we... Uh, call us and we'll come deal with that. So that, that's where we come into play. I think it's important to know some of the stuff we do do. And the very first thing I did was I set, set expectations for my police officers that they're to be compassionate and fair, but firm. You know, deal with the, the, the issues and, and also get to know them. And uh, I created a liaison officer, so Tai Zhang is the liaison and he does know these people and, he, and when he can, he goes to, to the meetings and and, uh, and they all, all the officers talk about who's, you know, they know everybody because, you know, they're out there on the street 24 hours a day. So there's a lot of communication amongst the police officers and there's a lot of communication with, uh, with the social workers that help. Um, uh, I think Ty is still going to the river once in a while with Mark uh, Ashamal to do, do checks. And we do also do criminal investigations that take us into the river. I think some people have this notion that we don't go into the river because most of it's county and if there's a crime and we think that the property or the suspect is in the river we go into the river uh, and we deal with that um, uh, i i talked to the sheriff's department and we and they put together very nice uh, uh, crisis intervention training and so i've sent all of my officers through the crisis intervention training although they've all had it it's never a bad idea to refresh that because let's face it, we deal with people that are, you know, they're in crisis mode a lot of the times. And so it's, it's good training. The officers can lean on that training and resolve or deescalate uh, issues. Cause like I said, we don't, uh, we don't want to use force and certainly don't want to use deadly force uh, on, on individuals who are just simply having a crisis moment. So that training was very important to me. Uh, I chaired, uh, I'm a representative for the California Police Chiefs Association, and I chaired a uh, working group on uh, the mentally ill and homelessness and wrote a white paper for them because we're all dealing with it, you know, and, and Santa Monica Police Chief was the one that said, if you build it, they will come because if you look at LA, they just all, everybody says, go to Santa Monica, they'll take care of you. And so there's some, we're not as bad, we're not as bad off as Santa Monica, places like Redding where folks get stuck there. Um, and I'm currently on a statewide coalition. Uh, the mayor of uh, Sacramento, uh, Mayor Steinberg, has put together a statewide coalition to talk about uh, the gaps and funding and stuff like that. And we do calls, and, and I've been up to Sacramento a couple times, or once at least on that. Um, we have a pretty good relationship with everybody in the room. I've invited several of them to my roll calls and my supervisor uh, meetings so that they have face-to-face -face contact and the officers know them. And, and uh, when, we, when we all end up at the ER with somebody or out on the street, they know each other and, and, and we'll continue to do that. Um, we've initiated a couple uh, uh, what what's called COPS areas. It's uh, community 
uh, oriented prop, uh, policing problem solving. And we have a, a private property that's fenced over here and has uh, a lot of homeless uh, people living on a piece of private property. And so we're working with the, the owner to get a, a MOU in place because we can't just go on private property and evict people. So as soon as we have an MOU in place, we'll, we'll help evict folks from his property, but then it's his responsibility to keep people out. So it is their pro it is his property, but I get it. You know, you can't just walk on a property and tell 10 people you're, you're leaving. So we're gonna help with that. Um, there's been some successes, you know, uh, the social workers know that they can kind of use us as the, you know, the carrot and the stick, and we know we're the stick, and sometimes we push a little bit on folks who are acting poorly, and we've had a couple people that are perpetually drunk, and and we don't want to arrest them all the time, but we, we kind of nudge them a bit, and then finally when they say, you know what, this I'm tired of this, then we say, well, that's great, and we'll call Jeff, or we'll call Mark or somebody, and they help, and we've gotten a couple people off the street. Uh, Jeff and Mark Ashimal have done uh, incredible work with people, and there's a couple people walking around our town that are sober and housed and, and happy, living a good life. So we, there are success stories. Um, this is what I'll say about the riverbed. So the county sheriff and, and myself are in talks, I would say, in negotiations because it's, uh, there's a lot more people in the river than, you know, it's, it's all illegal camping, but, you know, the political will needs to be there to tell the police to, to go and move people out of there for illegal camping. It's, it's a very sticky problem because if they're not in the river, they're gonna be in town. And I don't know if we're prepared for that, but it is getting a little critical mass because of the weeds are eight feet tall and it's gonna be a hot summer and there's, I don't know, there's just a lot of people living in pretty poor conditions in the river. So uh, I don't have a solution to that, but uh, I, I do think it's time we probably go in and, and, and evict folks and that'll, help some leave and some get nudged into saying, you know what, I could use housing or I can use help. So, uh, but that wouldn't be a unilateral decision I would make. That would be something that would come from a meeting like this or, or further discussions. Uh, one thing, other, does anyone else have anything for the chief? There have been some complaints of one or two of the homeless that have been aggressive, especially towards women. Yeah. And I think you know specifically one woman that they're yeah. aggressive to. <laughs> and um, so tell us what is the best approach if someone is aggressive. There, there, are, a couple, uh, there are a couple guys in town uh, that are pretty aggressive and they target people that they think they're going to intimidate. And a lot of times uh, this one gentleman, he picks on women. And, and it's easier to pull out money out of your purse and not be confronted by this individual. The reason I know about him is because he did this to my wife and she is not a wallflower and he probably regretted it. But uh, you know, there's, there's an issue and we probably should talk about giving people money because I, you know, the, one, of the, one of the gentlemen that is sober and housed right now, he and I are on good terms, but we locked horns a lot when he was drunk and panhandling. And now the, you know, now you know, at the time when I was talking to him, he'd say, well, why do I need to go down and fill out paperwork and get the social security that I have coming to me when I can sit here and make 70 to 170 bucks a day cash. Because I don't need that assistance and I don't want to deal with the forms. So you kind of enable, in my opinion, and I, you know, it's kind of funny in my office is, a, is some posters that before my time years ago was, were produced about not giving change to people and everybody put them in the windows and C3H is on there counties on there, Good Sam, all, everybody's logos on the, on the posters I have. And he was right, we were enabling him, and now he's not doing that, and he's, and he's getting the benefits that he's always had coming to him, he just never went and got them, so. So, oh, you know, I never na answered the question though, Mayor. I, I think you should call us, because we don't, it gives us a reason to get out of the car and say, you intimidated somebody, and that is, that is something that we could cite for and move them along. Councilman Starbuck. Yeah, Chief, this is kind of at the county also while we have visitors. We're talking about the riverbed. We know it's kind of a lair. But, you know, on the other hand, the county is, I'm going to say, very animate about enforcing off-road vehicles, 
people being down there, it's a critical area, the habitat, et cetera, et cetera. Right. But it's a blinder eye going past some of these camps. Not in your jurisdiction, the political will appears to fall in the county here. And does the county intend to just keep doing enforcement on recreational activities, or is there going to be a movement towards doing something with the homelessness there? I can answer the I, ATV I can, part. I can right. answer that. Yeah. Well, in the county, we have an independently elected sheriff who that responsibility falls upon. So um, honestly, his interaction here is really within his purview to, ad to address. Um, he's only accountable to the voters and not to the Board of Supervisors. So to get the political will moving, we need to talk to the sheriff then. Yes. So the quad project is something that's not done through supervisors, but the sheriff also? Correct. And Chief, did you have something you had to add? Well, you know, the, the, uh, the off-road vehicle enforcement is actually a grant they have, and so they're mandated to go and to, to do that. And, you know, I've had, we're having that discussion, hey, you're driving by the camps, and, um, and you know, the deputies know everybody in the river, too, that are down there. So... We are discussing with the undersheriff, Barney Malekian, and we are coming up with a plan, but when we produce a plan, we're gonna to come to the, to the city council and say, here's what we're thinking about doing, because we don't think it'll go horribly wrong, but if it did, we'd, we'd wanna have it vetted, this plan, before it, and it shouldn't. You know, we bring, we bring everybody here that can help, and we say, we understand this is your home, but here's everybody you can talk to and, and here's services. So we're putting that together. If, if I can pop sure. in here one more time. Sure, of course. Also know this is on the radar of the state water board um, through, their, through their permitting, because there's obviously a waste stream down there that they're charged to regulate. And um, I know that that, uh, that is on their radar as, as the county moves forward with future wastewater uh, permits. So um, again, that's one of, been one of the avenues that my office has tried to push to see if we get some action there. Okay, good. Supervisor Hartman, did you have something? I just wanted to add that uh, the mental health, uh, the behavioral wellness department of the county, as well as the uh, sheriff, as well as uh, people who are dealing with homeless are, are trying to collaborate, trying to work on this more. But I don't think we've actually focused on the Santa Inez River and Lompoc. And there may be more we could do to coordinate across these different silos for that purpose. Okay, good. Well, I, I agree with that. But, and we are working with the sheriff, and they've created a card that we could fill out so that we can all share information. Um, but you're right. The, I, I think Mark is probably, there's a couple people in this room that are the ones that go into the river. And it's more than a two-person job. It's a, it's a big job. I just, uh, Mr. Mayor, if I may add just a question. How much crime is homeless on homeless people in the river? Do we have any sense of that? Well, we, we have, it's, you know, the problem is we hear at third hand, there are uh, sexual assaults going on. Uh, there are, are people being robbed, but they don't, they don't tell us. They'll tell some of the social workers, but you know, we need them to come tell us or we need to find them. And we have gone out and talked to, to uh, one individual and she, she doesn't want anything to do with us. And she's being abused because of her mental condition, not because um, it's just, that's it. She doesn't, she, they know she's an easy target. So it's sad. We really like to help her. We really like to help all the victims there. And my worry is that the violence will we don't have a lot of violence, but sometimes it becomes extremely violent when you're fighting over something that's very important to you when you're that destitute. So. Councilor Mosby. If, if I can add a little bit before your time, there was a, a lady whose tent and such was set on fire. Yep. And that was a homeless and homeless incident. So there was also a gentleman who was found murdered under the bridge. Yep. And there was another gentleman, whether he was homeless or not, here just about a year and a half ago that was found on the end of A Street. One of the problems is because the city-county boundary has become a city or a county issue, so some of the reporting issues are in the county aspects, but by my watching and stuff, it's almost one a year we're averaging between bridge and bridge that's either accidentally, quotation marks, or something's happened where somebody has lost their life. Sure. 
Then if I may have a follow-up question, I, I wasn't sure about the vertical change in the data and who all shares that data? Is it between the police, the sheriff, the county, the city? Supervisor, thank you for that question. Actually, the data issue is a very um, interesting one because a lot is happening simultaneously. So C3H created a system that you referenced called um, Vertical Change, and we provided it for free to whoever wants access to it, and it's a way of sharing information about individual homeless people who agree to be kind of monitored. Um, it hasn't been widely embraced because there's a lot of, you know, each agency has their own privacy restrictions, each agency has policies and procedures about data and how data is shared and managed. So the federal government is actually mandating that we as a county do more data sharing through something called coordinated entry. And actually, Sylvia Bernard is the vice chair of the Continuum of Care uh, that is in charge of implementing the uh, coordinated entry system. And so we will see um, over the next couple of years, I think, an increase in the amount of data sharing that's happening uh, amongst homeless service providers. And then interestingly, at the same time, CENCAL is very interested in bringing the healthcare providers into this conversation as well as the county agencies. So we're seeing a lot more discussion at a county level about how to integrate data. And so I, I'm, I'm very optimistic actually that we're gonna see some big advances in how we share and collaborate around data in the next couple of years. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna go off script just for a moment. Sarah, did you wanna come up and, because you're part of the outreach as well, you just open, happen to be on my list here. Well, I just wanted to share that at the library, um, we are open 44 hours a week and we are happy to have anybody come in. We have computers. Um, we have copy machine, we have fax machines, anything that people need to fill out paperwork, we are happy to assist people with doing that. And um, I, we do get to know these people too when they come into the library. And I know that one of, one of our guys that um, used to be there regular like clockwork every day that he has finally gotten the help he's needed and that he was so super excited to tell us he actually had a place to live now. So um, I know that he relied a lot on my staff for assistance when he was looking for books on um, you know, overcoming alcoholism and things like that and that those were resources that we're happy to provide. We have a table set up too that has all of the community um, organizations that assist with helping people. We have that available so that people, if, even if they don't want to talk to us, they can come in and grab what they need. Um, but a lot of people spend the entire day in the library. We are happy to have them there. Um, if it becomes a behavior issue, then we take care of that. But, um, you know, our, our thing is the same with kids as it is with adults, is that, you know, you follow the rules, you can stay here as long as you want. And um, we have a lot that come to programs, too, because we give them something to do during the day. So um, the library is happy to help in any way. Okay. okay. Any questions for thank Sarah you. for the library? Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, uh, let's see. We want to go to Transitions Mental Health. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor and Council and City members, Mark Hashimala, Transitions to Mental Health. Um, basically, Transitions Mental Health, we're based out of San Luis Obispo. We're a nonprofit. Uh, we are contracted by the county to take the top 100, uh, probably uh, that need the higher level of care than uh, behavioral wellness can provide. Um, that's what I do for my nine to five, and it's a, it's a great job, but uh, then I volunteer to work with C3H, and we do, uh, I do, the outreach, I do a lot of outreach down in the riverbed, so a lot of these concerns I can address. Um, I do have permission from the county and Fish and Game and Chief to take my vehicle down there. Uh, I do take Officer Zhang and once in a while the county nurse. Uh, we do outreach to most of the camps, uh, especially before the rains came. We made sure that they got out um, and the rains did wash away a lot of the camps that were down in the riverbed. Um, we do know along the bed side, they do have some dwellings. I mean, you, they, they are building houses. You are right, sir. Um, 
It is a concern, and it is a concern for all of us outreach. Um, I, in my beliefs, and what I do uh, with outreach is, is I'm also, you know, looking for the mentally ill. Uh, those are my, my biggest concerns. I do have clients that are um, constantly um, raped in the riverbed, and she, she has a hard time coming forth with that, but there are, it is happening. Um, our, our goal is to get them back into society, obviously to get them housed, to get them back into, uh, you know, work, work and being a, a productive part of society. It is a tough, tough gig, but um, there are a lot of them out there that are willing and uh, work with us. I've seen a lot of success stories. Um, I've only been in the mental health business six years, and in the last three, doing outreach and working with C3H, uh, I've seen a tremendous amount of progress. Um, and it's hard for the community to see it. I think um, sometimes they might notice a certain person and then that he's not there anymore. And it might be that um, outreach or C3H or obviously some on their own. I think um, because of the relationships that outreach has built, uh, some of them figured somebody cares and they actually do a lot of the progress on their own and get, uh, get housed. Um, one of my sayings is a hand up, not a hand out. Uh, it's very important that we, that, you know, that we don't enable them. Uh, and, and I say them, there's so many categories of homelessness that I, it's, you shouldn't put them all in one category. There's, uh, you know, there's some with dual diagnosis, some with addiction problems, some, uh, I'm going to tell you a story now about um, a gentleman who's 83 years old. He's a veteran of the Navy. Um, Korean War, and he has, lives up on the hill for 11 years now. Um, doesn't drink or smoke. Uh, just physically has gone to uh, old age. Um, he's had a heart attack, and they put a stint in and sent him back up the hill. So, with outreach, we've uh, gotten one of uh, our homeless uh, has taken him on and is uh, taking care of him. And we've gotten several of the VA office members up there to see him. And we've worked diligently on getting him his proper paperwork and all the ducks in a row. And soon, hopefully soon, he'll be housed. But he is still up on the hill. So um, this is a, a major issue that we're all trying to deal with. It's um, for me to bring to the community, because I know a lot of you, the members here, uh, what we do and, and how we're trying in this community. And I see a lot of the community members that care and are affected, including business members, I can imagine trying to rent out Mervyn's if you own that property. It's very hard as people are sleeping out in front. Um, you know, it is a concern for us, the outreach. We don't want to enable them. We want them to come back to society. And it is, it's, you know, it's a major part of what, why they're homeless is, you know, self-degradation. They don't have the self-esteem. Um, people, you know, they, people treat them as homeless. It's, you know, if someone comes by you and says, get a job, you know, it's, it's very tough to, to then work yourself up to, to actually going out and applying. And, and, for, and first of all, you, you want housing first because you need to shower up before you need to, to go out for that, you know. And there are several that live in the riverbed that actually have jobs. And um, so we're working constantly as a group. Uh, I'm amazed at what C3H has done. I'm, I'm glad you continued with the funding, uh, including the transitions funding. Uh, this last uh, city council meeting. And um, I'm hoping to continue, uh, sometimes as a small town, things like this, projects like this fall by the wayside. And uh, we are making great progress. So uh, I hope that we continue to, to push forward with this. Are there any questions for me? Any questions? Councilman Mosby. It, Mark, you don't take any money from C3H, right? No, sir. And I think that's impressive for you to you know to be saying this about the c3h group having somebody who's so hands-on in respecting another agency's uh, you know progress well we're we're all part of the c3h uh, I, at least that's what i believe um it's a collaborative uh, but you, you volunteer with them i'm just i do volunteer i'm just because as your testimony paid. <laughs> right as your testimony that's what i was getting at there you know i yeah. I, well, I appreciate it and again it's uh, you know it's a and planting a seed will come up next, you know, amazing group that doesn't get paid. Uh, and, and the community needs to know that so we can support them in any way we can. Uh, and I appreciate the time and, and the consideration. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, Mark. Okay, planting a seed. Good evening, council members and city co or, uh, community members. My name is uh, Shondell Malcolm, and I'm the founder of Planting a Seed. And we're a nonprofit agency that um, is involved with street outreach in Lompoc, and we are also part of the uh, C3H collaborative team. Um, I just want to kind of go back a little bit as Jeff Schaefer explained. There are four steps to um, solving homelessness. Um, a key component of that is doing the street outreach. Um, not only are we looking to know each person by name, um, we're also trying to find out what stage of homelessness they're experiencing. Um, and the three stages that we're looking for is if they're in a situational homeless um, stage, which means that they're, um, they're homeless because of uncontrollable circumstances. They've either lost a job, they've had a death in the family, um, something that's caused them to immediately lose um, their income or their housing situation. Um, the other, or the second one is if it's a, if it's an episode, um, which means that mainly that the person is dealing with substance abuse, uh, mental health issues, um, and most of the time they can be housed, but then they end up falling back on you know, their um, substance abuse and so they lose their housing again, and it ends up being that cycle. Um, the third one is whether they're chronic or not, um, which means that the person has lived on the street for a long time, they have minimal resources um, to help them out of their situation, and that they also need um, supportive services built around them in order to help them out of their situation. Um, so this helps us determine um, where they're at and how we need to line up the resources for them. Um, one of the things that we do as well as just doing street outreach, and, and I'll tell you, we do street outreach twice a month in Lompoc um, on Saturdays, and then we also do a, a monthly feeding at the Bridge House, and then we do um, special events that um, around the community. So um, for two years now we've done, um, it's called Lompoc Community Connect, and we get a lot of uh, businesses together. They donate food. Um, we have um, barbers that come out and they give free haircuts. We have uh, CHC that comes out and they do um, medical, um, medical exams for them, eye exams. And then we also have uh, Jim's Closet that comes out and provides clothing for them. So it's an event that's put on at the Bridge House. Um, for the last two years, it's been at the Bridge House. And all the homeless come out and we provide these services. Um, and we also have other providers come out where they'll get, um, so if they have a dog, for instance, they can get um, their dog licensed and vac vaccinated because we know that's a huge issue as well. Um, so we want to make sure that their, their pets are taken care of. Um, but without doing the street outreach, um, the people that are experiencing homelessness have the potential to fall through the cracks. And then what happens is they end up being chronically homeless because they're, we, we don't know their situation. So that's a lot of it. Um, also, when we're talking about homelessness, um, there are different, um, different phases, I should say, or different, uh, different groups of homelessness. So we have people that are living in their cars. So in Lompoc, um, I, I don't know the exact number, but I, I would say there's at least, you know, anywhere between 150 and 200 people that are living in their cars daily. Um, we have people that are on the street, and we have people that are in the riverbed. So we try to get out and address um, each group when we do our outreach and uh, find ways to connect them to other support services. So, Shondell, the you said 150 to 200 people living in their cars, so <laughs> that population must have been missed with the point? It's not counted. Okay, so those are not counted, okay. Yes, come forward, yeah. <laughs> so this was an actually, I think, a flaw in the design of our point in time count. It's, it, there's a certain amount of, it's an entirely volunteer workforce to go out and do the counting. And so we didn't want to put people in a position where they were having to wake people up or, you know, to knock on 
essentially knock on doors and people where people are living. So if people could see that someone was in a car, we did, they did count it as vehicular. And I think on page five, I think there is some note, there, there is a count. What, what's the number, Jim? Uh, 12. So, so 12 people were counted, but it, it was not as systematic because of some you know, risk factors. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the uh, Councilman Starbuck. Shondell, just for my own information, uh, the question, I hear Bridge House is full. You know, I mean, it's at capacity. It can only house so many people. Is the reason that they're full and the riverbed is so close, do you think the reason that a lot of the homeless settled to live in the riverbed? Or is it just a coincidence that Bridge House is close to the riverbed and people choose to live there? Um, I think it's more of a coincidence. Um, a lot of the reasons why some people don't go to the bridge house is because they have to be clean. So they have to be um, you know, clean and sober in order to check into the bridge house, which um, is another concern for us because we would like to have some space where we could put people because if someone wants to, to get clean, they can't enter into a facility or a treatment um, center unless they are clean. But we have no place to put them anywhere, so they're just going to go back to their, to their own device and they're going to you know, drink or, or do the drugs, and then that just automatically takes them out of, the, you know, out of uh, being housed at that time or sheltered. Thank you. Uh, and just an FYI for uh, supervisors, your lights don't show up over here, so you have to sort of get my attention if you want to speak to me. Yeah. Bounce up and down, wave your hand, so. Okay, anything else from Shondell? Thank you, sir. Okay, moving on to uh, Trinity, Trinity Church. Thank you, Mayor, Council members, and community members. Um, my name is Pastor Brian, and I'm part of Trinity Church, who is one of the organizations that provides hot meals six days a week in town for our homeless or our marginalized. Um, and we're just one of those. And on Saturday, we are um, blessed to be able to also offer showers. We're able to offer meals. We have a crew that provides clothing so that when they do come to shower, they're able to get a clean pair of clothes every week. Actually, some of our gals take it seriously to make sure what their sizes are so that they can make sure that they have the right size when they come in so that they can get a clean pair of underwear, clothes, and um, all of that, as well as if they need clothing for job interviews or any of that. We also provide um, laundry one day a week. And so those numbers, just so you know what we feed, I mean, we're feeding between 65 to 100 people every Saturday a meal. I um, mean, that's for homeless and marginalized. Some of those are the ones that are teetering right on that border of becoming homeless if they aren't getting assistance with the food. We provide anywhere from 25 to 40 showers a week, and we'll do anywhere from five to 15 people's laundry. We meet them at the laundromat and do one load of laundry for them all. We also host the Care and Referral Center, which is through C3H, um, which is a great opportunity for them to come. The AmeriCorps members are there to help them find housing, or if they need assistance in other ways. We've actually even had an AmeriCorps member from Santa Maria come down the past two weeks who works with people um, that are dealing with felons, that are felony um, charges are on probation, and she's actually come down to help talk to them, and it's been a great asset. With that, also Doctors Without Walls comes in twice a month on the second and fourth Saturday of the month to provide free street medicine. They come up out of Santa Barbara, they've had podiatrists come up with them, and, and just are able to provide that care right on the spot. Um, so it's been neat to see that grow. It's a great way to be able to get to know who they are, get to know what their need is. And we open the building for about three hours in the afternoon, which gives them a place to come in out of the weather, a place to come in and sit and, and be a community. Because really, um, the homeless community in town is a community. They all know each other. They really all care for each other. When someone's missing, uh, they're the first one to let us know. When someone goes in the hospital, they'll be the first ones to pick up the phone and give us a call. Um, they, they are a caring community in the midst of that. Trinity also is on the, the verge of getting ready to launch what's called the MICA mission, which is a day mission. The plan is to open seven days a week from seven to seven and provide a place for those who are experiencing homeless situations or marginalized situations, a place to go and within the collaborative effort of all the different agencies. Um, be able to work with that. 
And so that's what's ahead, that's what's coming. What's nice about C3H, and I will say this, and the collaborative effort in town, is that it's not every day um, being part of the faith-based organization, I'll, I'll just say this, being part of the faith-based organization, being able to pick up the phone to a government agency and be able to have them respond and say, I'll be right there. Because that doesn't always play well in the government. The government and churches don't always seem to play well together. But let me tell you, in this community, with the agencies that we have and the care that we have for the homelessness, there is something to me being able to pick up the phone and call Mark Ashmalia and say, hey, I've got someone over here. Can you make a run over here? Hey, Michael. Hey, Barbara. And they'll be there on the spot. So that's what C3H has brought to this town, is that there is a collaborative effort that is trying to figure it out, that's trying to do what we can. And the worry isn't, you know, there is a worry if, they'll build, if we build it, they'll come. But they're already here. So let's care for who we have. So I don't know if there's any questions or any questions. Okay, thank you. Oh, okay. Um, I'm gonna go with AmeriCorps, then I'll go to go to you. Okay, okay, AmeriCorps. Good evening. Good evening. My, na my name is Patricia Faulkner, and as you know now, I'm a AmeriCorps member. I'm with C3H, Transitions Mental Health, through partnership with Helping Hands of Lumpur. I wanted to say that when uh, Chief Walsh, when he said that they are a vulnerable population, the homeless are a group of vulnerable individuals. They are not necessarily criminal. They may do criminal acts, but they're vulnerable. They're very desperate. They're decent individuals. There's gonna be some who are gonna go out and commit crime, but all of them are human beings. Everybody here who's already been up here and who's gonna come up here and speak, they look at these people as individuals. So we're not thinking about, let's do what we can so that we can increase the numbers, but we are going to take care of them because they are here. I was born in Lompoc way back in 1963. There was people in the riverbed then. Probably nowhere near as many, but there were there. The British House, I don't think, was there. So it's not fair to just say that somebody that's homeless is out there causing trouble. I can go out, I'm not homeless right now, I can cause trouble. Maybe I'm mentally distraught, I have been. A lot of people who are out there, they have very severe problems, mental, social. It's all in the way that you approach the person and see them that they are human. So I'm not going to waste anybody's time. There's people out here. I go to Trinity. I see Pastor uh, Brian, Reverend Thomas, all these individuals on a daily basis. I work with them. We're out there in the field. All of them have something to say, and we're not just wanting to turn them away. We're not wanting to offer them to come in. We're only wanting to help and assist them, and that is what we do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Reverend Brenberg. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and the City Council and all the people that are here. My love is for the homeless people. And I was going over some notes before I got here today. I drive uh, at least 200 people per month. As I've been doing my ministry for 16 months, I've found that God has helped me find homes for people in different places. So in place right now, I can take them to, we don't have a follow-up system. We placed in a year and a half over 60 people that I've found different people in the community. I go to them, they get them rooms, they give them houses, they get, you know, and things like that. 28 of them, as I speak right now today, are not homeless anymore. And one of the first things, Jeff had a good formula there because uh, I get to know him. But the first thing about to get to know him is I have to respect him. 
as a person and believe that they can do much, much better. And because of uh, being able to encourage them, like I said, I can take you to 25 houses right now of people that's been homeless, that keeps their place. But I, I take time sometime during the day uh, or during my course of the week to follow up with them. And uh, Jeff had four things there that was really good. Can you put your things back up there? Uh, the four things Jeff had. Knowing everyone by name. That starts with respecting them. Respecting that they have an ability and they have a mind and they're not treated like they're just homeless. That gives me the insight to be able to help them. And they tell me things about a lot of agencies don't tell them about other agencies. We just had a man come up here and speak about a shelter that's going to open up where they can go and be off the streets doing the element. And we already got a place here. And sometimes they're at the bridge house and nobody knows. I'm driving kids around. And, and, and they, don't, they don't have no place to go. And there is a place here where they can go and stay all day, use the computer, and have a social worker there to help them. You know? It's, it's, we need to get more coordinated for help here as far as the people go. But uh, I've just reached out into the community the man in the mirror is what we all need to do. And, and, and found people that will help them get on their feet. And whatever day they want, these agencies want to go, I will take them to 25 people in the last 16 months that have been successful and moved from homeless. Everybody knows I can bear good, that's Nick. <laughs> you know, if I need an apartment for someone, I'll go to him and say, give him a chance, please. And I seen the community here respond. And so, like I told you, I get the opportunity to see 200 people every month, just riding them around for free. And uh, I be at the, the, the Longpoke uh, Hospital so much, everybody know me by name. OK. Well, but. Uh, I just think that we can do a better job of working together okay, well, thank and you, respecting that's... those people because what divides us the most is economic. Mm -hmm. It ain't race, color, or creed. It's economic. And when we get back to doing those things and everybody is one, we can make this world a better place. Okay, well, thank you. Because that's what this meeting is about, getting everyone to work together. Okay, we're gonna move on now to Good Samaritan Shelter. So I brought some brochures of our programs here. Um, so if you can pass those down. My name is Sylvia Bernard. I'm the executive director of Good Samaritan Shelter. And um, we operate a number of programs here in Lompoc, including uh, Bridge House and Mark's House, Hope House, Harvey House, um, Recovery Way Home, Another Road Detox, and re uh, an outpatient program. So I wanted to talk about the services that we provide and also talk about homelessness in general. So I, I just want to remind you that, um, and actually Chief Walsh had reminded me of this. I saw him at the coffee shop earlier and he had reminded me that, you know, homeless is not just those that are living on the streets. Homeless is, um, there's subcategories. There's veteran homelessness, there's chronically individual homelessness, but the largest population are those that are sheltered at this point. And that's who we serve. So our model of services is really to be a housing ready model. And our goal is, is that um, we feel that the best way to be able to address homelessness, um, especially amongst families, is to um, do it in a sober based model and get people the help that they need, get them stable, get them ready for housing, and then be able to place them in housing. And that allows um, us to be able to get them ready to be good tenants, um, allow us to build relationships with landlords, and be able to 
really um, try and be a good neighbor. And, and I wanted to address some of the comments that you had made earlier as well, because we want to be a good neighbor. Um, so, you know, the, the programs that we provide are at Bridge House, we have, um, we have, we are serving an average of about 85 to 90 clients a night. We have two sides to it. We have an emergency shelter side um, for individuals and families. And then we also have a transitional side for families and for um, individual males. And on the transitional side, um, homeless, in, homeless individuals and families that are on that side can stay longer. Um, longer than the 90 days that they can stay in the emergency shelter side. Um, there is a case-by-case -case basis where people can get extensions if they're working um, with their case manager and getting into self-sufficiency that they can stay longer than the 90 days. Um, Mark's House is a 19-bed transitional shelter program here in town for families. Um, the city graciously gave us that property, and we just did a complete remodel of the inside of the house. And in addition to that property, there's also a single-family home on there that we've rehabbed, and it's called the Harvey House. And we moved a, a family in there that lives there in permanent housing. Hope House is uh, three units of housing. It's a triplex that ha provides transitional housing for families as well. And, um, and they can stay there for up to two years. And then Recovery Way Home is our residential program for um, 16 women and their children zero to five years old. So we have about 32 people residing there. They can live there for up to six months while they go through um, treatment, drug and alcohol treatment. They get mental health services. And um, many of them reunify with their children that um, at times are in the foster care system. We also have a six bed detox um, here in Lompoc. And within those programs, um, we really provide additional services. We provide transportation, we provide case management, we have rapid rehousing funding where we um, help pay for our families to move into housing. Um, we work with AmeriCorps, we have our own AmeriCorps as well. And we work with other agencies, we work with Coast Valley, we work with um, all the county departments. And, um, and our goal is, is that we can't we can't tackle homelessness by ourselves. You know, I, I kind of feel like the police chief that, you know, there's a homeless issue and it's like, we gotta call Good Sam or the police department because somebody's in charge over there. And we're, we, can't, we can't resolve all the issues. Um, we have created our model of how we deliver services. We have 160 beds here in Lompoc, which is pretty significant. Um, we have a, overall 500 beds in the entire northern Santa Barbara County, but 160 are here. And you have to know that our agency took a huge risk in coming to Lompoc. Um, we have always been typically a Santa Maria-based organization. Um, we were approached by the city and the county in a crisis when the shelter systems went under about five years ago. And um, we leverage and raise over 1.5 million a year for this community. And most of that money actually comes from the county of Santa Barbara for those services. Um, they invest a huge amount into serving the homeless. Um, the city of Lompoc has been very gracious to us with the Marks House. They provide ongoing funding. They just were able to coordinate with SBCAG to provide a bus service back and forth um, so that the, there isn't as much danger risk on the bridge. Um, but this is a partnership, and this is our community, and these are our neighbors. These aren't those people. These are our neighbors. And um, I'll tell you that the, the biggest issues that we have really is housing. So if you want to do the basic economics, as the gentleman said, um, this county has less than a 2% vacancy rate in the entire county, okay? So if you look at market rate housing and you look at someone that's working minimum wage, hopefully if they're working minimum wage, maybe they're full-time, which doesn't happen right now, but that could be possible for entry-level jobs they would be making 21000 a year to get an apartment that costs an average of $1,000 if you're lucky. You have to make three times as much to be able to qualify and have a good record to get in. So our friends and our neighbors that are within our system, within our community that are less fortunate are competing with people like you and I for the same units. So when you put that on, you know, if you look at Good Samaritan and at Bridge House, over 65% of our adults are all working. And it's tough for them to be able to get into housing. And if you have families, you know, there's restrictions. Like, you can't bring, you know, a family of four and move them into a studio apartment. It doesn't quite work that way. So there are a lot of challenges that, um, that, are, that are within the system. Um, there is good news on the horizon. The good news is, and Chuck had mentioned it earlier, is that, um, you know, there is a universal um, 
uh, release of information. So this was kind of a shocker for me, because if you know me, I go to every meeting there possibly is. So I'm in Santa Barbara like three days a week, and I go to all these meetings, and I've been going to these meetings, and everyone's like, we need a universal release of information. No one can share data. No one can share data. And I happened to be at a county meeting, and they said, we have a universal ROI is what they call it. And I said, oh my gosh, did county council approve it? They said they did. And I said, oh my gosh, people need to know about it. So um, that's gotten back to the SenCal group, the Dignity Health group. Um, the county has been amazing on that document. They listed every single organization. They just need to add C3, which was the only one that wasn't on there. But the rest of us were. But I was so impressed that the county council has taken a step up and said, yeah, we realize that the sheriff's department and the police department and you know everyone doing outreach and AmeriCorps needs to communicate, um, including the hospitals. So that, that is a huge step in the right direction. Um, the, other, the other piece is, is that they're, they are talking about doing coordinated entry. It's a complicated term really from HUD, which we don't even really know what it means. But the concept is, is that um, someone would be able to do outreach or um, or police chief would be in contact with someone, or we would, and anyone in this group and anyone within the system of care would be able to do the same assessment and be able to assess people and refer them to the programs that they need the most and be able to coordinate and collaborate with organ all the organizations countywide, not just within Lompoc. And that's pretty significant, um, I think, because it's a great step in the right direction. So um, the one thing I want to, there's a couple things I want to say is that um, I don't think it's beyond our capability of absolutely putting a sign up saying Bridge House. That's, that's an easy request. So I'm going to give you my card, and um, please contact me directly. Pat Brady's here as well. And then Brian Halterman did not um, mention it because he's here in a different role, but he's now our new Bridge House manager. So you can actually just go across the street and talk to him. <laughs> but we're happy to be better neighbors. Um, you know, we know that we're probably not the best neighbors always, but our goal is to be good neighbors. So anything we can do, um, the Bridge House, as many of you know, is a county-owned property, and the, um, the county has graciously given us the use of that. And I can't imagine what this, what this community would be without having the Bridge House, without having a shelter here in place that's an emergency shelter. I can't even imagine if they were not able to support in that way what would happen i mean you would have a huge issue within your community on the streets more so than you have now um so i um i'm here to to definitely answer any questions i appreciated a couple things um mark ashmala had had used the quote and said a hand up not a handout that's actually good sam's motto so i appreciated that we feel the same way and from the librarian, I really appreciated that that's kind of how we work, you know, follow the rules and you can stay. So we do have rules and, um, and we have it for the safety of, of the clients. But remember, we have kids in our program. And, you know, people have always asked me, I've been at Good Sam for 20 years, and people always ask, why are you still there? Why, why are you so committed to Good Sam? And, you know, it's because the kids didn't ask for this life. And so if those kids can have a chance of getting out of homelessness and into housing, that's why we do what we do because they deserve a better life and they deserve to go on to college and have a better life and not experience this as adults with their children in the future. And so that's why I personally am invested in this because I wanna see less people hurt, but I wanna see um, people be able to get out of homelessness and get into housing and back into our community because they're capable of that. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, Councilman Mosby. Yeah, being one of your neighbors, I wanna you know, thank you guys for what you do, but there is one minor unintended consequences that happens when you, you force the sober living, which I fully understand your plan and agree with your plan and model. And some of those people that are used to coming your direction but can't stay sober end up nesting nearby, so to say. And unfortunately, that was with one gentleman um, who got hit by the car and is staggering back to his camp, which was on county property in the trees there that he, you know, was existing. Um, but there is that level of that and understanding which yeah, but it, it, I don't know, and it's, and it's difficult to get the people who are at that level to have them go somewhere. I'd, I'd spent years talking with that gentleman and trying to get him to go to the next level. Um, you know, he, he looked at, he had, he had money coming in. He did look at it as a level of camping so mindset was as such, but he had a hard time, you know, enjoyed his alcohol way mm -hmm. too much. 
So it yeah. is kind of one of the things that does happen in that area, and I think that's what Councilmember Starbuck was referring to. So, it, you know, it's a challenge. I mean, we we run the warming centers, so they do have a place to go during the inclement weather, and Good Samaritan runs those with funding from the county for um, both Santa Maria and Lompoc. But I have to tell you, in Santa Maria, this isn't an issue. I don't know if it's the location of the shelter system. Um, but in Santa Maria, we don't have people encamping around the shelter system when they get when when they're discharged because they can't get clean. Um, so, so I think that it may be the isolated location. Um, you know, the bigger discussion could be: Would City of Lompoc consider putting a shelter site within the city? And I've been here for a long time, and I don't see that happening. I mean, it didn't happen back in the day when you guys opened Bridge House. So, that would be the only other alternative unless you can get the riverbeds cleaned up and be able to, you know how isolated it is out there as, you know, being a neighbor. And it's, that's a tough cookie to, to really get to. I mean, I don't know what the solution for that is, but, but it is tough. I mean, you know, unless you're gonna have a busing service, you know, they show up and they're under the influence and they can't stay, you know, we can't bus each and every one of them that, that can't do that. So it, it's a tough call. And, you know, he, he stayed out there overnight and it happened in the morning. And you know, and that's tough. That's a tough call. No, it's and it's not a large number. They're just it's not it's a large not any, number. And and with the new busing and, and it's going on, they're helping. I I understand. I haven't got the numbers yet from city staff, but one of the buses I believe is half full, and the other one's almost 100 percent full. It is, so. and we really appreciate that. I know that the county actually funded it, um, working with SBCAG, and then you guys were able to um, change your rates to be able to adjust to make that happen, and we really appreciate that. I mean, that bridge is is an issue, I think, with or without the bridge house. I really do, and um, and, and i got to be honest. I've been out there driving past it and thinking I would be scared to death to cross over that bridge myself, and I can't imagine our clients, especially with kids, so I'm so grateful for the bus system. And the one thing that Good Sam has committed to is that we are going to start um, in the in the fall. We're going to start an after school program out there, and we're going to we're going to fund it within our um, funding that we have to be able to to allow the children to come back earlier and their parents. And we'll provide the staffing for that during that during that time, so that that's an easier process as well. And what about summertime right now? Because you have coordinated a little bit more with the schooling, so when the the, the children are. On so summer we're break, what? We're going to work with the Boys and Girls Club um, to be able to try and get some of the kids out to that program. In Santa Maria, we actually run what we call a Good Sam Summer Camp. Um, we don't have the funding for that this year here. It's something we might want to think about in the future. Um, but we are working with other organizations to try and get them occupied and in school. If I mean in programming, but if they're not in programming, um, we will be flexible and allow them to stay during the day. Um, just hate to see it go back because we reduced the number crossing that bridge right, significantly. Right. So we'll make community. sure that we work with that. Thank you. Anyone else? Sylvia, I have, uh, and I and I apologize. I meant to talk to you about this before this meeting, but so you're going to blindside me. I'm just yeah, kidding. I know. I, it kind of is. And if you if you prefer not to discuss it, maybe talk to people and get back to me on it. But several weeks ago at one of our council meetings, I was I brought up the issue of. Um, restricting unhitched trailers, motorhomes from city streets. It did not pass, so I mean, we're back to the normal right now, but one of the issues that came up was the number of homeless people that do live in motorhomes. You have a, you have a big parking lot over there. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just Bob wondering, Nelson. <laughs> yeah, I'm just wondering uh. if it's possible, and I've talked to our city manager, because I'm not sure what the people that are, that are homeless do with their waste. Um, human waste in the motorhomes, but the city would be willing if we could get the, allow the homeless and their in living motorhomes to use a parking lot, they could then unload their waste in our River Park uh, dump station there. It would, it would help out both ways. So, I mean, if you want to say yes right now, that's fine. If not, you want to talk to maybe. <laughs> have, you con have you considered having them park at River Park? Um, I don't think we have enough space there. So, okay. yeah, you, but it, it probably, you're full. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, that's a super loaded question. So, I know, um, so I, I yeah. don't expect an answer tonight, but uh, maybe just think about it. The possibilities. I, I understand that all of a sudden there, there may be some issues with um, a, a large number of people in there. Um, they would have to have the sheriff's department just make a round once in a while or a police department. But it's something I'd like us to at least address. I think safety in numbers is one thing. You know, so you've, you've got the people that are living in their motorhomes isolated. They 
could be a little bit dangerous um, and also be a place for them to, um, to dump their waste. So maybe talk to the supervisors and see if that's a possibility out there. Um, I have no idea if it work or not, but it's just something you may want to consider. How many do you think that there are in the city? Um, well, there was... Was it was the 150? If someone has it... Okay, so um, you may want to I won't, look at Yeah, it. I won't answer that right now. Okay, I, I wouldn't <laughs> expect you to answer right now, but maybe it's something we could look at. Um, a place for them to live safely there. And also, you know, like I say, we could, as a matter of fact, I, I believe the city is allowing some people to dump, we give them a certificate or something like that right now, so. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. And, and I can imagine the additional supportive services that would have to go with it that would create. Mr. City Manager, if you want to speak, you have to come to the microphone. My caution on that thought, and of course that's in the county, so it's outside of our jurisdiction, but if we were looking at that internally within the city, um, we discourage encampments because of uh, a number of um, social and antisocial issues that arise from that. And what you're describing sounds to me like an encampment. That's why it would have to be discussed and, you know, pros and cons of it, so... Okay, anything else for Ms. Bernard? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we are going to now go to, it'll under treatment, it's behavior wellness first. Thank you, Mayor Lingle, uh, city council members, fellow community members. My name is Michael Allen, and I am the Mobile Crisis and Triage Team Supervisor for Santa Barbara County Behavioral Wellness here in Lompoc. Um, the triage program was a grant-funded uh, proposal about three years ago, which we just got an extension. Uh, we are preventative services for people who we found out we were trying to reduce um, psychiatric emergency visits to ERs, overwhelming our um, hospitals and emergency rooms for people for maybe unnecessary need. Uh, or also it kind of morphed and developed into preventative services because um, like Mr. Ashmala with Transitions has the top 100 most difficult cases that behavioral wellness can't manage. Uh, we also started trying to address and to pick up and assist with the caseloads for the core uh, team uh, for behavioral wellness services for adult outpatient. Um, our region actually does, isn't just in Lompoc. Um, the triage program was developed uh, through the grant funding through all three regions, basically North County, Santa Maria, South County, Santa Barbara, Lompoc, we finally got in on the ground floor and we actually encompassed, um, we worked with Buellton, Solvang, San Inez, um, and also uh, Los Olivos, so, so we have a large area. But uh, it's basically for preventative services. Um, if they're new to the area or if they've been off medications, um, maybe they just need to get restabilized. We offer intensive case management for a short term, about a 60 to 90 day window, which gives us the time to decide um, what services they may qualify for. If they are um, what we call our target population, maybe have a specific diagnosis of say schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or something that can be treated with the outpatient basis, we'll um, refer them to our core services or possibly to ACT, which uh, with, with transitions, or we refer out to the community. Um, I did provide some brochures in the back um, as well as some cards for resources, so please help yourselves, and I've also brought some here as well. Um, but the triage program, like I said, it's, uh, our goal was to reduce hospitalization uh, ER visits by 50% for the first year, and I think 70 to 75% over the next two years. So we've been trying to work with that, and then it just kind of morphed into this collaboration, which I'm very grateful to Jeff Schaefer and C3H to involve us in, to, because the homeless population, for a lot of them, have mental illness. I mean, it, the, the statistics vary, but they're very alarming. And I guess if anybody was faced with homelessness here, you're going to have the anxiety, the depression, the sense of panic. And then when we do find stay, when we find housing for these individuals, for a lot of them, um, they might have trouble, uh, trouble maintaining their stability. So they're not taking their medications. They may get evicted because they're turning their radio up so loud because they're trying to drown out the voices in their head. 
or they may have some sort of a you know psychotic break where they decide that they want to start you know putting their laundry in a drain pipe and over flooding the apartment below them so those are the kind of issues that our triage program and our mental health is trying to work with everybody to collaborate with to try to help um, with the triage program in all the three regions we have a psychiatrist that uh, can see them a social worker we provide case management psychiatric services advocacy services medication supports and also we're available seven days a week from about I think it's 7 30 a.m. till 8 30 p.m. at least in, in Lompoc and in, in our area there so um, I think and we also do peer support so yeah we're composed of the social worker recovery assistants one of whom is very dedicated she joined me uh, Barbara she's been with the program since its inception uh, as well as a um, med support nurse, either a psych tech or an RN that we have as well to try to help with those medications. If they're having an episode or they may need to see the doctor right away, um, right now our core clinic is booking out, I think until early July for appointments for a psychiatrist and we're in the process of changing again, at least with the core clinic. At least with our psychiatrist, we're able to get them in uh, either on a Tuesday or a Friday typically and we'll even move people around that may be more stable. So that's what we're trying to do because we figured that the, if we can reduce the psychiatric admissions to a hospital, those are very expensive and the county pretty much pays for it. Uh, our PUF, our psychiatric health facility in Santa Barbara, we call it the PUF, is our inpatient facility for people that are hospitalized for um, non-voluntary psychiatric treatment. We have 16 beds. The census um, years ago for the population for Santa Barbara County, they said at that time we needed about 72 or 76 beds to actually make, to, main, to maintain that support. So we're constantly full. We're referring out to other area hospitals. Vista Del Mar is the closest one, LA, Bakersfield, and it's just a matter of, you know, it's, it's easier. If we can prevent it that way, that's what we're trying to do with the triage services. The county's budget, obviously people are well known with what's happening with that, so they're in the process of trying to figure out how to restructure it to keep the program intact so that we can continue this program to actually keep the preventative services so that we're preventing it rather than just reacting to it. I've worked um, in the core clinic before, so with the caseloads of 60, 70, 80 clients, a lot of times you're just kind of whack-a-mole, putting out the fires as they pop up, and it's really, it was really, it's really neglecting the client care for those that might be overlooked. And so with the triage program and the people that we have working for it, it seems like it's really helpful, and we're just collaborating between the housing, public health, APS. I was at a DSS, a Department of Social Services meeting earlier today, uh, with uh, the Adult Protective Services to go over some of those uh, people that we were trying to share information about what what could we do to brainstorm and to get the you know the word out and to address cases but yet at the same time we're still bound by oh we can't talk because it's private information so but that's essentially what we've been doing and hopefully after uh, 2018 we'll continue to be able to do that so okay. any questions any questions okay thanks sir thank you Okay, uh, Coast Valley Treatment Center. Good evening, City Council. Um, before I get started, my name is Chuck Madsen. Before I get started on Coast Valley, I'd like to say a couple things. Um, is there a solution to homelessness? I like to compare homelessness to addiction. I love addicts. I, I know addiction. Um, there's so many dynamics that, goes, that go into the homeless population and why somebody is homeless, just like there's so many dynamics that go into addiction and why somebody chooses to use drugs. Um, I think tomorrow if we opened up 150 apartments here in Lompoc and, and tried to put every single one of our homeless into one of those apartments, we'd still have homeless. It's that simple. There is no secure solution to solving homelessness. Um, on, another, on another point, I moved to Lompoc nine years ago on high control parole, an addict, with nowhere to live. If it wasn't for the blessing of my grandparents offering me a bed, I would have been at the bridge house. And the services in Lompoc giving me support, I might be one of the statistics in Lompoc. Um, I did go into the police station my first day here in town as a requirement of my high control parole 
and was asked, why are you moving to Lompoc? Originally being from the San Fernando Valley, LA area, being considered a terrorist of the community from where I was from. And I was asked, what are you doing here? Why are you in Lompoc? And I said, my mother's buried in the cemetery here. I'm here to start a new life and I'm here to give back. And they said, we'll be watching you. I said, go ahead. And if it wasn't for Good Samaritan Services who gave me a job the day after I got off parole and the services that are here tonight, um, I, uh, in reality, wouldn't be, you know, the director of programming for Coast Valley Substance Abuse Treatment Centers today. Um, you have the recipe for success here in Lompoc. You have people that go out of their ways, whether they're paid or not, to support those in need in our community. You, you have people that have stepped up and given their lives to giving back to those in need. Um, I'm sure you've heard of Coast Valley Treatment Centers. I started working for Coast Valley Treatment Centers eight years ago, and uh, lucky enough was given a job because I wanted to work with adolesc the adolescent population that suffered with addiction. And my mission was to first collaborate everybody in town with our services, because I knew uh, addicts didn't use drugs just because they like to use drugs. You know, so I went to the mental health department, which is now behavioral wellness. I went to Good Samaritan. I went to other agencies. I went to the, you know, police department, and I went to the probation department, and I said, you know, and public health, and I said, you know, our, the clients that are coming to our programs are ultimately seeing you tomorrow or have seen you last week. Let's start talking. Let's start working together. And that's exactly what, you know, Jeff and Chuck are doing with C3H. And I believe that motivation and that collaboration with other agencies has been the success of Coast Valley Treatment Centers. We are a nonprofit. We don't like to use a lot of grants. We don't use a lot of, uh, uh, of funding because we like to be able to cater our treatment services to whoever walks in our doors. Uh, but currently on a monthly basis, we provide services to about 800 individuals in the cities of Santa Maria and Lompoc and provide other services such as food distribution, shelf, uh, sober living services, um, jobs at our, our, our thrift store and other things to about another 300 individuals. So on a, on a monthly basis, we're providing services as a nonprofit to about 1,100 individuals in, in our communities. Um, it is my job, even though I'm, uh, I am a uh, convict, addict in recovery and a member of the recovery community in Lompoc, um, I guess you, you, you're supposed to call me an executive. Um, <laughs> But it is my job to oversee approximately 30 employees, seven locations, um, and to start up new projects for Coast Valley, and to make sure that all of those locations and all of those employees are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, this trust has been given to me by you know, two wonderful gentlemen that, that believe that somebody that had the experience that I have knows how to do what we need to do for the people that walk in our doors. Um, to our specialty is substance abuse treatment. I don't know the solution to housing. We don't do housing, we do sober livings. You know, we do outpatient drug, drug treatment for adolescents and adults. And what we've done over the years is we've bro broken down that treatment into specialized services for whoever walks in our door, whether it, they be a female with PTSD who has been raped or abused, whether it's been an adolescent that's been trying substances at one of our local high schools, whether it's a convict walking out of prison after doing 10 years, you know, whether it's a veteran you know, with PTSD that, that, that doesn't know how to live without drinking every day. You know, what we've done is we've been able to break down our services to specialize in, in whatever population walks in our door. And I'm proud to say that we will never turn away anybody that walks in our door asking for help, lacking financial resources. Um, we have a lot of things going on in here in Lompoc, as I'm sure that you've seen me stand up here before the Planning Commission and other commissions trying to get things approved here in Lompoc. It's always been a struggle. Um, our sober livings are not accepted greatly. Our programs are not accepted in the communities that we try to open them in. So every step of the way over the eight years I've been doing this, it's been a struggle. Um, but we do have a five acre ranch on the end of G Street, or end of J Street. We do operate pay it forward thrifts and gifts. We have two outpatient treatment centers here in Lompoc. We have the Miracle House Women's Home. Uh, this will be our fifth year putting on Recovery Day in the park, a totally free event for the community of Lompoc. And we also do a food distribution almost every week 
here at two different locations in Lompoc. Um, I'd like to say, you know, today, as I told you, I moved here nine years ago on parole, um, a, a, a convicted felon. Um, I spent over 11 years incarcerated in my lifetime. Today, there's people like, you know, Pat Walsh, who I can text, you know, and say, you know, I need some help. Or there's people like Ken Ostini, who has welcomed me as a friend, and other people in, in the community that, you know, don't judge me by the tattoos all over my bodies or my body and don't judge me by my past, but they've judged me by what I'm doing, you know, and trying to help the community. And there's a huge population of residents in Lompoc that are just like me that need these services to be able to make that next step and cross those barriers to give back to those in need. You know, there's, uh, we have more recovery 12-step meetings, AA and NA, in Lompoc than in Santa Barbara and Santa Maria combined. There's a, there's a huge population in Lompoc of, of addicts, people in need, you know, so without these services, without, without everything that's going on, you know, um, you'd still have the homeless, you know, you, you, you would, and, and that population would grow, you know, um, I, I just can't say enough, so. Any questions? Th thank you, Chuck. Um, I don't see any questions. No? Okay. Well, I, want, I want to thank you. You are truly a success story and a really inspiration. Thank you, Bob. So, thank, thank you, you very much. Good Samaritan, you're up again. So I'm just going to take two minutes. So um, on the treatment side, Good Samaritan provides a, we have a six bed um, detox here in town and um, the average stay is usually 14 days. And um, that is going to be changing within the next fiscal year. So starting July 1st, um, it's going to be a requirement of the county that they turn into residential treatment, which means that individuals that stay can stay for up to 90 days. So that will be a change, not this fiscal year, but next fiscal year um, due to funding. Um, in addition to that, we have an outpatient clinic called the Lompoc Recovery Center. And we provide um, individual um, uh, group counseling for substance abuse treatment in addition to intensive outpatient treatment. And then we also have um, Turning Point, which is at our perinatal programs. And that is an outpatient program where we serve both the women and the women and we provide child care on site for the children there um, that live at Recovery Way Home next door. And then we also provide that for the community and then we provide transportation for those women as well. Um, and case management and all the um, support services to go with that. And that's pretty much our treatment programs here in Lompoc. Okay, thank you. Okay, housing retention and flexible local dollars, C3H again. So the, the last thing I wanna address and then maybe we can open to public comment or other things other community members may wanna share as needs is the idea of a flexible local dollar fund. Um, for those actually homelessness or recently housed. And the reason why I bring this up, I have another hat I wear. I'm the director of initiatives for the Uffizi Order. We created a flexible local dollar fund in the Santa Barbara City to help secure a housing unit for survivors of trafficking. Um, working with business community and um, faith community partners, we had to raise $12,000 to secure the unit for a year, and those partners came together to do that. There are needs um, in the community um, that happen all the time that are just little dings that people on the streets uh, don't have funds for like application fees. So a $25 or a $35 application fee over and over again, they have no ability to, to uh, pay that and that stands in the way sometimes of them getting a unit or feeling like they can apply for a unit. Uh, reunifications we did in Santa Barbara City, C3H um, downtown organization helped fund a, a reunification day when I think it was 15 people were reunified over a weekend. Um, and that took uh, funding for them. Uh, basically, it's about 300, it was about $300 a person uh, to do a healthy re reunification. We're not talking about putting people on a bus and sending them off somewhere. We're talking about making contact on the other end with family members or business opportunities so people have somewhere better to go. So we could do a reunification weekend in Lompoc and just find out if people have a better place to be um, and get some people out of homelessness just because we made the communication happen. 
um, but we need those funds um, in order to, like I said, potentially $300 a person. Um, talking about treatment op options, oftentimes there are um, treatments available to people that have some level of cost that again, they can't afford, so they're not getting the treatment that they need. There are free treatments as well that can be used, but sometimes some come with costs. Household items, a lot of people move in with little or nothing, um, and so we're always scrambling around, and I'm, I'm, I'm always impressed by this community doing outreach. They figure it out. They find the Facebook page that Tyann's created. The um, People get on there and say, hey, I need a bed, or I need uh, these supplies, and the community comes together. That's the thing about Lompoc, is that the community does care, and when things are brought up, uh, the community does respond relatively quickly, but it could be more, it could be more quickly. Then there's an emergency. There are emergency issues that happen to where um, I was, you know, I was helping somebody today who had their power shut off because they couldn't pay a um, a bill, and that they were unaware of. Um, so their power was shut off, and that sometimes spins people into a crisis. Right? They've been recently housed, and then they spin into a crisis, and then all of a sudden they they feel like they can't handle anything. Um, so little needs like that. So what I would ask the community and also the council is if you have connections of, of businesses or members that might, might want to help fund such a fund to do these kind of, um, it would be over, we already have partners that oversee the fund, would oversee how it's used. Again, it's not a handout, so it wouldn't be used for sleeping bags or for socks or for food. It'd be used for only for people that are on their way to exiting or recently housed. Um, but they can always uh, connect to me and I appreciate um, the effort, uh, Mayor, for you bringing this together and for the community members. Thank you, everyone who shared. I just, I'm so impressed by all of you and the efforts you give. Um, and I really feel like Lompoc's coming together. So that's all I have to share. Okay, thank you. Okay, oh, Council Mayor Mosby. Yeah, Jeff, okay. you know, after being the, the Previous two years, I was the liaison with C3H, and, and you know I think we learned a lot of what was going on, and you're watching your coordination, your movement through the C3H, but, um, and you guys, a lot of the, the homeless know that I, I spend a little bit of time, I got a few properties in town, and I, I had a, a number of issues with them, and I've actually gone to a level now of, of zero tolerance, and I found that allowing them to exist on there is a level of, of, of actually dehumanizing them, and actually one was murdered on one of my properties here uh, a couple of years ago, but um, which led me to the point of, you know, basically the zero tolerance, which a lot of other people are understanding. They might have that level of compassion, but I think the compassion is actually coming to more of a dehumanizing, allowing them to be walked over type of thing. But there's a, there's a couple parts of homelessness, I think, that, that fall through the cracks. And where, where we do a lot of outreach for people who, who kind of want some assistance, we do outreach, there's the addiction aspect, there's, um, but th there's, there's sections that we aren't touching at all, there is really, aren't groups of people here, and, and you know, some of the people have the mentality and the thought process that they're just camping, and they're existing, and that, that number is, is sizable, and not recognized. There are people who just need time. There's another group that's, that's looked out, you know, it's not really that they're camping, but they just need time, leave me alone, and that time might be a, a day, it might be six years, but they're not really, we're not really gathering them, we're not embracing and bringing them in. Um, we have, there is a section of people who just, and some of those are in the motor homes that are around, um, they just lost housing. And they're kind of in and out transitioning. They're gonna get it back again, it might be a week, it might be a month, and in between jobs. And, and they're, they're not really coming to the sectors that are here. We're, we see them, we feel them in the public out there, but there really isn't um, a, a group that, they gather and they come through, um, but it's just, I think that's important to understand and, and seeing as, as review, that not everybody who's homeless is an addict, not everybody is an alcoholic, not everybody is, there's a whole faction, and I think that was pro that's probably one of the biggest fallacies. When we try to attack the problem, we call it homelessness, and I've always kind of professed we need to actually divide that in multiple categories, because it's homelessness. It's kind of, it's kind of like housedness. There's, you, I mean, we're, we can't, you, know, you can't fit everyone under one umbrella with housing, right? This, right? So it, I think there is such a broad issue that's out there. My own opinion is this, and I mentioned this at our last policy council. What I'm picking up is the, oftentimes the federal government's making cutbacks, the counties need to make cutbacks, the cities are needing to make cutbacks. 
And with, for me personally within C3H over the past five years, that four and a half years I've been with C3H, I've been willing to try to put best practices together using minimal resources. Because I didn't have the same amount of resources that you go to San Luis and they have a 50 now, or you go to these different areas and they don't have the same resources. If you're, if you're talking about just the basic outreach component, which is still, I feel like, for those people experiencing homelessness that can't get into the system or are currently not in the system, which if you look at the data, if I remember correctly, let's say it's a third of the Lompoc population. Most of them are in the, like Sylvia said, most of them are in the shelter system at some level right now, but there is a third of the population that is not, and for whatever reason, won't or can't. The only way you can massage a change there is by quality, coordinated outreach with all of these people in the room talking, coming together with us, being on the same page, and being on the same page with those people who are experiencing homelessness as well, which was a big reason why we got a better count, was we actually worked really closely with the, the community that is currently homeless and talked with them about, hey, this is something we're doing together. We're not working as a housed, unhoused population. We're trying to get on the same page together, which is a big part of it. So I would say to, uh, what I'm boldly saying now is you kind of, and so look, if you, what you heard tonight is you heard a lot of volunteer outreach folks that are doing this volunteer not paid, right? And they're doing incredible work. You wanna increase that capacity so you can have more dividends, like do reunifications, like do those kind of stuff. We gotta figure out how, as a community, how do you enhance that? How do you do it more? So my hope is that all these, I don't feel like I got involved with people people on the streets through my meal sharing in Santa Barbara City originally. So I, I got involved with people who were homeless as my friends kind of deal. I've moved slowly into this other role. Um, I feel like it is the community's responsibility or opportunity, I would say. And that's why I believe in collective impact and coordination and what we do, collaboration, because it's a, it's a community effort if we're gonna see a change here. And I do not wanna see, this is my own opinion, the uh, federal government, the county, or the city backing off. Um, at whatever level there's a responsibility. I have a responsibility because I am getting funded. I have a responsibility to do a good job. And the other partners that are being funded have a responsibility to doing a good job, but I, I wanna see their, their responsibility still relies upon some government agencies to make sure that we get the resources we need to do a good job. Does that make sense? So that's a long answer, but you, that you got me. <laughs> Thank, you, Thank you. Okay. Um, we're going to go through a, a public comment question. You know, public comment. If you have a question, we've got a lot of people in here that could possibly answer, but keep your um, questions real specific and comments real specific. Can we put a two minutes on each timer? And also, as you leave tonight, there are information from the people that spoke today on the back table if you want to pick that up. Yes. I'm Pat Brady, uh, and I actually work for Good Samaritan, and I'm sorry I was late and missed half of this, but I had another appointment. Um, what I wanted to say was I wanted to thank Jeff and his boss, Chuck. Um, Jeff, I feel, has brought this community together uh, as far as homeless goes. I really appreciate him. Um, people like Shondell, uh, who go out to the bridge house and cook meals. It's amazing. And I have seen in the four years you've been here, I've seen the difference of the communication, the outreach that's being done. And I say that all, it all goes to Jeff. I really, really appreciate him. He has done an excellent job of bringing us together. And I just see a bigger, brighter future if we continue this way. So thank you, Jeff. Okay, thank you. Mayor, City Council, Nicholas Gonzalez, resident of Lompoc. So, Mr. Uh, Reverend Brandenburg made a, a comment about economics and, and how that's largely responsible for a large part of our homelessness. And I just wanted to share with you, I was just looking on my phone for the 217 fair market rants for 
uh, Lompoc in the Santa Barbara metropolitan statistical area. So as of 217, fair market rent for a studio is $1,131. For a one bedroom, it's $1,323. For a two bedroom, it is now $1,555. A three bedroom is approximately $2,000 and a four bedroom is approximately $2,483. The problem's not gonna go away unless we start addressing the elephant in the room, which is we need more housing. And what we don't necessarily need is strictly big track homes, large expensive homes, but we need to start designing housing that accommodates everyone. Uh, smaller unit sizes, maybe reduced parking standards, communal living environments, cooperative apartment complexes. And the only way we're gonna do that is either through some very aggressive infill or through some additional expansion, which then becomes another hot topic. But until we address the housing need, these housing prices are continue to skyrocket. And then when you add these housing prices with the utility expense, it's, housing is becoming beyond reach for half of our residents in town. I mean, so we often look at, and, and many people explain the social problems, but are the social problems why they don't have housing or is it because they've lost housing and now they fall into despair and they have social issues? I would challenge, I'm not the professional, so I, I, I would ask that question. I know I have tenants, and I've kept rents in some instances the same for almost 10 years, with the exception of having to adjust for rental increases because of the increase in water, the increase of electrical, where I have group apartments. Uh, we have to do something, because even building affordable housing is not necessarily helpful. Some of the units were about 500,000. That's not sustainable. So we need to really look and refocus on housing and look at it from a different perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Anyone? Sean Del Malcolm again. Um, I just want to say thank you. We have a couple of our um, people here that are experiencing homelessness. And I just want to thank them because, um, you know, we're, we're all talking about this coordinated outreach effort, but we've left them out of the equation um, in some parts. But they have come to me on numerous occasions and asked me to um, help them clean up the riverbed. So that's something that we haven't talked about. Um, last year, we took a unit out there. We coordinated with the, with the county. Um, with the state and with the city of Lompoc. We took a rolling bin out there and we cleaned up over two tons of garbage out of the um, riverbed. Um, and the previous year we did the same thing over by the Mervins building. We cleaned up that, that whole area over there. And when you go down there now, there's, it's not an eyesore. You know? And the, the people that are camping down there have kept it clean. So I just wanna thank you know, our people that are experiencing homelessness for, for coming to us and trusting us to help you out as well. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? You know, Mr. Mayor uh, and the city council and all the people, uh, one of the main problems that I see that's hurting a lot of people that move into residence is that we have these low income housing, such as like in the PA and those things where there's all kind of crime. I got people, I got as many as 20 people call me to go talk to the chief about the problems in their neighborhood. And a lot of people, if you pull me out of the toilet and throw me in the sewer, I can't do no bad. And so we got to have somebody that solves these problems that, say for instance, in a good neighborhood, you're not gonna stand on the corner and sell drugs. You're not gonna stand on the corner and intimidate people. 
We need to have the same type of policing it in these low income areas that we can make a change where people don't have to keep going in and out. Because they can live there and be happy. But we have a problem there. Because there's a different, and I know from experience, I'm a homeless man three years ago, that there's a certain amount of living that is expected when you're poor. And it shouldn't be that way. We should get the same policemen, we should get the same thing in the neighborhoods that everybody else gets. And if you'd like to talk to some of those people, I'll get them fight. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Good evening. My name is Brenda Villa, and I have lived uh, homeless in Lompoc since June of 2013. I have lived in the riverbed. I've lived up in the canyon areas. Um, the homeless family that is out there in the Lompoc Riverbed, we're our family. Um, as in any kind of family and community, we have theft. We have some of our people that are addicted, alcoholics. Um, but we do have families out there. And we do have people that have jobs out there. And where it falls through the crack is, like Mark had mentioned, we have an 83-year-old Korean vet out there. Some of us, yeah, we do choose to live that way. And our problem of why we cannot be indoors should still, we should have the respect to have that privacy of why we can't comply with the normalcy of day-to-day -day living. And I, I think people like Shondell, because when I said, you know, this is where we live. We don't want to be throwing trash on the riverbed or having even kids on the riverbed. Kids don't belong there. But as the police chief said, it's not a crime. It's not a crime to be homeless. And I know that we are going to have more children out on the riverbed this summer. So, I mean, that's the reality of it. And that's basically all I have to say. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, well, listen, I want to thank everyone for coming. I, I told you when I started the meeting, this was hopefully we'd be providing some information um, for you as to what services are available to the homeless. Um, I don't know if we came up with any real solutions other than maybe a sign at the bridge house for you. So possibly a solution there. But um, there's a lot, a lot of people out there that are providing services. And if you have an issue, uh, get some information over there, bring it to their attention, we can, uh, we can get it addressed. But again, I want to thank you for being here this evening. And good night. <laughs>